for our expert's interview, we'll have the honor of speaking with Dr. David Pizarro, an Associate Professor of Psychology at Cornell University. Dr. Pizarro is a leading figure in morality and emotion. His research interests are in moral judgment and the effects of emotion on judgment. He received his PhD from Yale University and has received research grants from the National Science Foundation and was a summer fellow at the Center for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. He's also given a widely acclaimed TED Talk on the strange politics of disgust. So I'm pleased today to be speaking with Dr. David Pizarro on morality and disgust. Hi, David. Thanks for speaking with us today. Hi, thank you, June. So, we're all curious, what got you first interested in emotion in the first place? Sort of, where did it all begin? The honest truth is that I was interested in moral and ethical judgment first. And I really, really wanted to study moral psychology, but that was at a time when it wasn't a very popular topic, uh, especially within social psychology, which is what I had started studying. But I realized that if I studied emotion, a lot of work in social psychology had to do with emotion and its influence on behavior. And some of that work was on its influence on altruism and prosocial behavior. Uh, so because emotion had this deep link to morality already, both from old school philosophy and in more modern social psychology, I decided, well, OK, well, I'll also study emotion just as a way, like kind of as a sneaky way to study morality. Um, but I came to love it on its own, as, as I hope is evident. <laughs> so being a sneakster then, I want to ask you a few questions about your research. So um, you study disgust. I know most of us can all think, think about things that like really disgust us in everyday life. I know I'm pretty disgust sensitive, and I think you might be too. <laughs> I'm very, very disgust sensitive. But it's a problem, actually. <laughs> <laughs> hard to do research. <laughs> yes. <laughs> can you tell me, what is disgust really? Like, why do we have it in the first place? Uh, that's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? So disgust is um, what many would call a basic universal emotion. That is, no matter where you look, it appears that people across the world have it. It emerges fairly early on in life. And it seems to be a, an emotion that's dedicated to a pretty specific function. And that function is to keep you away from eating or touching things that might make you sick. Uh, so even the word disgust betrays the origins uh, that the gust part uh, refers to the, the taste function. And for instance, if you give little babies a really bitter or sour taste, they make a very similar face to what we make when we get disgusted as adults. So the thinking is that disgust is an emotion that evolved really to keep us away from, from what we now consider gross things, but, but what we say, when we say gross things, we really mean things that are dangerous because of their possi possible contamination. So then are there things that disgust all humans universally, or does it seem to vary cross-culturally? Yes, so disgust, <clears throat> disgust is a great emotion because the list of things that seem to disgust people universally is pretty robust. And so when, no matter really where you look across the world, with some exceptions, people don't like things like pus and feces and, no? and rot, <laughs> rotten meat. <laughs> At least I haven't encountered any culture that eats pus on a regular basis um, as a delicacy. <laughs> See, this, this actually shows you another feature of disgust, how easy it is to engender uh, disgust, in, especially people like us. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But that's not to say... Just because as, you, as emotion researchers, we love the universal part. So the list for disgust seems pretty, pretty big and robust. But uh, the list of culturally variable disgust elicitors, those things that make us easily disgusted, uh, is actually much larger. So um, I'll give you an example. For Chinese people, the fact that we eat cheese is pretty gross. So they, they, they are <laughs> they're, they're going to ask us questions like, wait, you wait until the milk gets rotten? And then you wait until it curdles up into solid balls and you combine those together and you eat them. And to them, that's just utterly disgusting. Of course, mm -hmm. to us, many of the things that, uh, that people eat in mainland China might be disgusting. And that reaction is just as powerful. But it is culturally variable. And one reason that it kind of has to be culturally variable is that we grow up in different environments, different, different places, and we're required as children to eat different things. It would be very bad for for us to have such a rigid disgust response that even as infants, we rejected everything. So there's a huge variety of things that we can learn uh, to eat and not be disgusted by. 
What's really cool about the work you've done on Disgust, too, is that you show it's not just, you know, uh, designed to sort of expel, you know, nasty curdles of cheese balls or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever your thing is, but that it actually also can influence, you've shown, like higher order moral reasoning, such as, you know, attitudes about homosexuality or political affiliation. And how is it possible that disgust can influence these kinds of more complex attitudes? Yeah, so yeah. that was a puzzle to us because it really does seem like disgust ought to be constrained to just those things that might make you sick. The problem is nowadays we have all kinds of information about what really is dangerous and what really isn't. So we know, for instance, we have a, a proper germ theory of disease. We know that uh, shaking someone's hand won't give us HIV, for instance. Um, disgust as the emotion didn't really know that. And so the story that, that uh, I, I believe about how disgust evolved and many others who study disgust believe this is that disgust sort of spread from not just keeping us from eating bad things, but also from anything that might be potentially contaminating. But what happens is that people are one big source of pathogens for us. And so anybody who encounters a stranger whom they have never encountered before um, is running the risk that they're going to carry diseases that we don't have immunity for. And so it behooves us to have this emotion that, that actually would keep us away from uh, from coming into close contact with especially people who look sick. So any marker that you might have a disease, like an infection, who one of the disgust elicitors that I use very reliably is, I have a friend who's a dermatologist, and she gave me access to this data bank of, of skin diseases. Oh, gosh. So, so, so skin diseases are like a big warning yeah. sign, like stay away from me because you mm -hmm. this might happen to your skin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so because disgust has these features. One, it's really, really easy to elicit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you, as you know, and as other people who, who are you're going to interview know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's really hard to bring people into the lab and, yeah. and actually discuss them. Um, so it's really easy to elicit. Uh, it, it can easily be tagged to people because people are a potential source of pathogens. So now what you have is an emotional system that's biased toward rejecting and avoiding individuals and sometimes even groups mm -hmm. that might either appear diseased or might have any sort of difference in their hygiene, in their cleanliness customs, in, their, in the food that they eat, or even in their sexual behavior. Um, and it turns out that sex is quite easily linked to disgust. I don't think I need to go into exa any examples <laughs> about that. Um, but the sexual domain is one that lends itself very nicely. So a lot of the work on disgust has been around uh, its, its it function in preventing us from, from engaging in incest. Um, so that's a good thing. And so so now you have an emotion that can easily be linked to individuals or groups, especially ones that are different, who are different from us. And it makes sense that it would be a very powerful emotion if what you're trying to do is convince somebody else that, for instance, homosexual behavior is, is wrong, right? It gives you that powerful gut reaction that, oh, that's gross. That's something that I don't do. Um, and, and therefore it's wrong. So do you think that this is a special feature of disgust, that it's this special emotion that can, you know, influence our moral judgments? Or are there other emotions that share these kind of similar features as disgust? It, you know, when it comes down to it, if you, if you really, as somebody who studies morality, if what I really want to do is try to explain all of human moral judgment, disgust is only going to play a small role. All emotions have this power to influence, to influence judgment broadly and moral judgment in particular. Disgust has, a, a, it appears to have a very specific tie to, to human morality that some of the other ones don't. But, um, but when you look at it, some of, some of the emotions, some of our social emotions, for instance, like anger and sympathy or empathy, those are kind of tailor-made for, for our social relations and something that in, we might refer to as ethical judgment. So for instance, when you're angry at somebody, it often contains this element of blame that they did something that they should not have done, and I want justice or revenge. Mm -hmm. um, disgust, disgust is interesting in that even though it might only affect a small bit of our moral judgments, it isn't. Its proper domain doesn't seem to be moral evaluation in the same way that anger or sympathy might be. Sympathy seems like it was built to make us care about other people. Anger seems like it was built to to keep others from cheating us. Disgust seems to have been built to keep us away from gross, sickly things. 
and now it seems overextended. And so it seems as if if it fires, it overfires in a way that actually might make our moral judgments. We might have to be careful in a way that we, we don't necessarily have to be careful for some other emotions. So not let disgust kind of go uh, un, unharnessed, just kind of go wild. Right. And one yeah. example I like to give people is, um, you know, just because something is disgusting doesn't mean that it's wrong. So, for instance, yeah. I, I find it very disgusting to uh, to pick your nose, right? I, I think everybody probably finds that disgusting, but nobody goes around saying "down with nose picking." Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, when when you're using disgust yeah. as the sole as the sole measure of whether or not you think something is wrong, I think you really need to kind of check yourself and say, yeah. "Oh, look, there's a lot of a lot of really disgusting things, but but are is it necessarily true that they're wrong?" And what we find is yeah. that what may be going on is that some people are more likely to use disgust as input into their moral judgment mm -hmm. than others. And so while everybody might be disgusted, say, at particular sexual acts, some people stop at the disgust and say, well, that has nothing to do with what I believe about whether you ought to be allowed to do that. But some people actually find it as a perfectly reasonable thing to, to use their disgust as input. So you've also found that disgust influences really important, you know, healthcare related behaviors, such as deciding to go for a cancer screening or to avoid it, right? So yeah. what impact do you think disgust can actually have on our own health and sort of public health policy? You know, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting feature of disgust that my colleague Nathan Considine, who's actually a, a clinical health psychologist, was interested in. And I hadn't given it much thought. But the truth of the matter is when you have a disease, it's easy to be disgusted at yourself. Um, and so a lot of these health, health behaviors s require us to go to the doctor and do things like provide stool samples or urine samples or show the doctor that disgusting part of your body that you've been embarrassed to show anybody else. And that, given the power of disgust, you know, I've said a few times now, it's a strong, it's a strong avoidance response. When you feel disgust for yourself, um, you're ashamed to show the doctor. This, this is a very powerful motivation that keeps people away from going to the doctor. So there are all kinds of, of, uh, uh, people who, for instance, have a growth that goes completely unchecked, and by the time they go to the doctor, the doctor's like, "Why haven't you come in earlier?" And the truth is that they were they were afraid to, or ashamed, or disgusted by themselves. And so, part of what I think needs to be done is is I think people don't realize that doctors, in fact, <laughs> are very very well trained in avoiding disgust for that particular domain. And so, uh, and so one of the, the health messages when we're trying to convince people to engage in, in these positive health behaviors like screening behaviors, we need to tell them, look, doctors seen a lot grosser than that, right? <laughs> that's right. I'm sure they have. And <laughs> though maybe you're the one person, right, that's the grossest <laughs> they've that, ever seen. <laughs> well, I think anybody who browses the Internet for a sufficient period of time has probably seen just as many gross things as I have. <laughs> So what do you think, then, is in the store for the future study of emotion? Is it a you disgusting know, future, or what's the out there? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's interesting. Yeah. I, uh, when I started studying emotion, it seemed like a, a fairly novel thing. Uh, so th the history of the study of emotion in psychology is kind of interesting. So we had some very, very powerful early, uh, early research, and then, and then we just started ignoring it for a while. And then there was this explosion of research in emotion that, that was exciting, and, um, and I think a lot of the reason that there was this explosion was because of uh, an increased uh, availability of methods to study emotion. There, there are more and more methods that psychologists can use, um, and that hasn't seemed to stop. So my fear was always like this would, it would ebb and flow and that, that we might sort of lose interest in emotion, but I don't think that's happening. I think with increased methods, more, we're learning more and more about what emotions are and what they do. And so I'm actually really, really optimistic about the future. I mean, now, nowadays we can buy devices for a couple hundred dollars that are portable that can measure your physiological reactions um, throughout the day. We couldn't do that even when I was in graduate school. It was, which was a year ago, June. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have cost us thousands and thousands of dollars. And so, so there's nothing to stop us from, and even with internet data collection, even if you're talking about just sheer, sheer subjective emotional responses. Um, it's, it's just becoming easier and easier to study emotion. So I think that the big task before us won't be to, to gather data. It will be to make sense mm -hmm. of the overwhelming amount of data that we have. 
So we need we need young, good emotion theorists to try to make sense of what's going on uh, in these data. And I hope that that's that's a, that's actually what happens in the next 10 years. People who are smarter than you and I who are currently in graduate school will come along and make some sense of it all. I'm still in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but speaking of these students then, sort of what advice would you give grad students or, or younger students, people may be thinking about studying emotion, what, what advice would you give for them as they think about embarking in this, you know, uncharted t terrain? Yeah, the, the biggest piece of advice I have is don't lose your curiosity, your broad curiosity. Um, because if we're really going to make progress, we need students who are interested, intrinsically interested in the topic such that they will read, they will learn about every, everything. Emotion, as you know, is one of the most truly interdisciplinary topics in psychology. I mean, psychology is already uh, touches on so many other fields. But emotion in particular, you can read uh, evolutionary biology, genetics, you can read sociology, you can read uh, the philosophy of emotion. And there's this problem that when, when students come into grad school, we have to get them narrow. Mm -hmm. we, you come in with all of these broad interests and you're forced to go narrower and narrower. You know, by the time you're done, your, your dissertation is like, you know, on the effects of X on Y when Z is, is in population, you know, the, and it's, it becomes such a narrow, narrow topic that that has the possibility of killing people's breadth and so so don't lose sight of the fact that this is a truly deep and interesting and broad question and read read whatever floats your boat that has to do um, with the topic you know if you read robotics you can learn about emotion don't don't stop doing that um and and for god's sakes don't do anything that you don't feel any intrinsic interest in they, they will never pay you enough to study something that you don't want to study just because it's the hot or popular topic. <laughs> well, thanks for talking with us today, David. Um, this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. David Pizarro from Cornell University.